we are jumping back into the chapter, the process of prophetic fulfillment. And what we're tackling over the uh, last week, this week, and next week is really this whole idea of how do we close the gap between when God says and when God does. Because sometimes that gap is much longer than we expect. And what we see from scripture is that God's faithfulness to his own word happens in collaboration with human obedience, human faith, human patience. And so what we're doing is we're identifying some key things, some important insights from scripture that we can implement into our own lives in order to take us from that place of when God said something into the fulfillment of when God does something. So last week, if you were here, you know that we had some recommended reading. Now for week one, we had uh, about three chapters. For week two, we only had one chapter. And some of you, some of you may have been a little disappointed, thinking to yourself, "Why did I only have one chapter? I really wanted to get into, you know, the content." Well. Today, we're going to give you a lot more to chew on in terms of your recommended reading. So here are, here's the recommended reading. Check it out. Ezra chapter 4, 5, and 6. So the next three chapters. Then from there, Haggai, which is toward the end of the Old Testament. Some of you are like, well, I've not been in that one in a while. It's okay. Right at the end of the Old Testament, uh, near the end, three books before the end. Haggai 1 and 2, so that's the whole book of Haggai. And then Zechariah chapters one through four. So that's nine total chapters. And again, if you don't get through all of it, hey, I get it. But what's gonna be really insightful about reading Haggai and Zechariah is after you read Ezra four through six, you'll then have the historical context that they're prying into. A lot of times, one of the most difficult things of reading and interpreting Old Testament prophets is trying to figure out what they're talking about, who they're talking to, what are the circumstances, and sometimes we read them inside of a vacuum and just try to sort of cherry pick verses that apply to us. Well, when you read Ezra's four through six, then you read Haggai and then also Zechariah, you're getting the very specific details that they are prophesying into and it makes the entire, um, it makes the entire prophetic passages come to life in a new way. So those are your recommended readings. Now, to navigate through this chapter of the process of prophetic fulfillment, we are going through portions of the book of Ezra. We won't have time to go through the entire book, really about the first half of the book, or the first two-thirds of the book. But let's go back to Ezra chapter 1, verse number 1, to remind ourselves about why we are reading the book of Ezra. Here's what it says in Ezra chapter 1, verse number 1. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. And you'll see bolded there these phrases, that the word of the Lord might be fulfilled. That the word of the Lord might be fulfilled. So this is the introduction of the book of Ezra, which means the rest of the book is a description of how God fulfills his word. How God fulfilled the prophetic word that he spoke by Jeremiah. So it's not just the first chapter that describes how God fulfilled his word. It's the rest of the book. All nine chapters are a part of the storyline of God's fulfillment. Last week we looked at the theme of it takes all of us. Because the amazing thing, the exciting thing about the book of Ezra is that all these different tributaries contribute to the river of God's faithfulness in this storyline. The historical background is that the Jews have been taken away into exile into Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. But God speaks through Jeremiah and he says, in 70 years I'm gonna bring you back to the city of Jerusalem and you're gonna rebuild the temple. And it's not just one specific person God uses to fulfill that prophetic word. It is person after person after person, and everyone's individual storyline contributes into the larger storyline of what God is doing for a city and what God is doing for a nation. Because when God speaks prophetically, he doesn't just speak individually to you or globally about, you know, human history and where it's going. He also speaks in regard to communities and their part in his global storyline. And that's where we're putting our emphasis during this chapter. How do we, as a community, get into rhythm with God and see prophetic 
fulfillment happen. So last week we considered this insight. It took all of them. It takes all of us. Your part matters in God's storyline globally and for this community. What's the insight we're going to look at today from the book of Ezra? We're going to look at this idea, generational unity. Generational unity. So in order to consider that, let's go to Ezra chapter 3, verse number 1. This is a part of the recommended reading we have from Ezra chapter 3. We're going to highlight a few verses from the chapter. So Ezra chapter 3, verse number 1. It says, when the seventh month had come and the children of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered together as one man to Jerusalem. Ezra chapter 3, verse number 1 says, the children of Israel, they have come back to the land. Everyone is dwelling within their own city, within their own house. But there, be, there came a moment where all of the individual families, all the individual people, they came together as one man in the city of Jerusalem. And when they come together as one man, when they come together in unity, the promises of God move forward through them as a community. It is a requirement for us to see the promises of God that we come together as one man. It's not enough that we all have our individual storylines functioning with our, within our individual homes, our individual houses, our individual families. We need to get, come together as one man to see the promises of God move forward. This idea of unity is prominent throughout Scripture. You see over and over again that the promises of God are waiting on a unified people in order to happen. And there's a lot of different places we can look in Scripture to consider that. But let's go back to the story of Gideon. It's found in Judges chapter 6. Gideon is, you know, living within a time where the children of Israel, they are harassed, they are oppressed by their enemies. And God speaks to Gideon that he's going to use him to deliver the entire nation from that particular enemy, the Midianites. And watch how Gideon responds. This is in Judges chapter 6, verse number 15. So Gideon says to the Lord, oh my Lord, how? I love the question, how? He's not necessarily doubting that it will happen, though maybe he was. Gideon, I think, kind of wrestled with that. And so it's not so much, will it happen? It's how? How are you going to do this? How can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And watch how the Lord answers. And the Lord said to him, surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. In other words, how am I going to do it, Gideon? I'm going to raise up a community, an army, that so functions as one, they're going to be as though they're one man. He didn't say I'm going to deliver them through one man. He didn't say I'm going to deliver them through you, Gideon, and you're going to be the man. He said I'm going to deliver the Midianites as one man. And from that moment, God begins to take Gideon and the army of the children of Israel through a process to bring them to unity. And the process wasn't overnight. The process wasn't fun. It was painful. It dealt with all of Gideon's fears because when he starts to assemble the army, he begins with 32,000. But God looks at Gideon and says, it's too much. Why? Because you're not one man yet. So I'm going to take you through a process where I'm going to refine the community. And though you're going to begin with 32,000, you're going to end with 300. But the unified 300 are going to accomplish more than the divided 32,000. So from Gideon, we learn this principle. A unified remnant is greater than a divided multitude. We don't necessarily need 32,000 within this localized church community to see the promises of God manifest for the city. We may only have 300, but a unified 300 can accomplish more than divided multitudes. A remnant is only a portion. It's only a handful. But if a handful get unified, they can do more than is even imaginable. But they had to go through the process of being refined to become one man. Now, of course, we see this idea of unity, not just in Ezra, they came together as one man, not just in 
uh, judges where God, through Gideon's leadership, you know, refines them to make them one. Of course, one of the most famous moments we see in scripture is in Acts chapter two in the upper room. So let's consider what it says in Acts chapter two. Again, it is a moment of promise because Jesus says, go and wait for the promise from the Father. So yes, it's a moment where the church is born. Yes, it is the infilling of the Holy Spirit, but we can also look at it through the lens of prophetic fulfillment. This is Acts chapter two, verse number one. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. The phrase I wanna focus on is that phrase, one accord. Now we can consider the end of it where it says in one place, but it's interesting in the Greek, that phrase one place is actually a reflexive pronoun that points back to one accord. It's essentially saying, think about this phrase one accord. It's essentially saying one accord, I wanna point to it again and I wanna emphasize it. And the word one accord in Greek can be translated as unanimously. What does unanimously mean? What does unanimous mean? It means there was no opposition to the agenda. No one in the room was standing against what God was wanting to do through them. They were unanimous. They were unified. They were as one man. But I actually want to go a little bit deeper into this Greek word because unanimously gives us the idea that they all took a vote and everybody said, yeah, I'm on board. That's not quite how it plays out in Acts chapter 2. They didn't just present something, do you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Actually, yes, that's a good idea. Let's all take a vote. Nobody opposed. Let's be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's not how the unity happened. So let's look a little bit closer at this word, one accord. It's actually a compound word in Greek, and one of the words actually does mean in the same place. But the other word means something a little interesting. So you see it right there, the uh, English phrase, one accord, then you see the Greek word, and then you see the transliteration and the pronunciation guide. So the best way to translate that word is the word passion. And most of the time, actually every single time in the New Testament that it's translated, it's translated as fierceness, indignation, and wrath. And you can think to yourself, why is it translated wrath? And what is it saying in Acts chapter two when it says they were in the same place with the same wrath? Well, the idea of wrath is literally the panting of breath. And in scripture, breath is the idea of spirit. So the reason why it's translated wrath is because when you're at a place of wrath, your spirit reaches a boiling point that it is now coming over, it is now coming out of you. So what it's saying in Acts chapter two is that they prayed to the place that everyone's spirit was boiling over with the same passion. They were all groaning for the same thing. They were long, and that's what it looks like to be one man. It's not we all voted on the same thing and we all agreed on the same creed. It's that we all got into a vein of prayer until the overflow of our passion was pointed in the same direction and everyone was in that vein together. That's why it's so important. If there's any possible way for you to prioritize a prayer space here at Ramp Church, we want to encourage you to do that. Why? Something happens in the place of prayer where your spirit reaches a boiling point where we can overflow with the same passion of God's heart together, and that's how prophetic fulfillment moves forward. All right? So they came together as one man. Now, how does this process of supernatural unity happen. Now, some of you may be thinking, I thought the title of this message today was generational unity. It is. We'll get to generational in just a moment, but first, I just want to continue to talk about unity for a few more seconds before we transition and talk about the generational side of what this looks like. But let's go back to the idea of how does this kind of supernatural unity happen? How do we actually become one man? Well, let's go a little bit closer into the story of Ezra and find out what caused them to be unified in the city of Jerusalem. So this is Ezra chapter three, verses two and three. Then Jeshua, the son of Josedat, so this is the high priest that's leading alongside Zerubbabel, if you remember the details from last week. And Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, so he is the governmental leader, a son of David, and his brethren arose and built the altar of the God of Israel. Verse three, 
Though fear had come upon them because of the people of these countries, of those countries, they set the altar on its bases or on its foundations, and they offered burnt offering on it to the Lord. What really catches my eye about this moment is that the first thing they do before they lay the foundation of the temple, before they lay the foundation of the building, is they lay the foundation of the altar and they rebuild the altar. Because ultimately, what causes us to become one man is that we are gathered around the altar of the Lord. If our unity is not built upon his altar, then it's built upon the wrong foundation. What do I mean by our unity being built upon the altar of the Lord? The altar of God is the place of his sacrifice for us, number one, and then our response of sacrificial living to him, that's number two. The altar is the place where God provides for us through his son, Jesus Christ, and it's the place where we respond with an obedient yes. See, in the book of Hebrews, the writer refers to the cross as an altar. It says, we have an altar. But the idea of sacrifice and altar is not just reserved for what Jesus did on the cross. It is also then expanded to the response of the Christian life, which is why the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 12 that we are to be a living sacrifice. This idea of receiving from God's altar and responding, responding to our own sacrifice is captured so well by the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. Here's what he says, talking about the sacrifice, the altar of God in our response. For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus. That if one died for all, talking about Jesus dying for us, then all died. And he died for all. Why? What is the response of those for whom Christ died? That those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Paul is saying at the altar, Jesus gave his life for us so that we can respond by giving our life to him. So these two ideas are really summarized in the altar of God. Number one, we come to the altar. Number two, we become an altar. How do we see, see supernatural unity in the church? Number one, we come to the altar. Because at the cross, everyone comes on the same plane. None of us have an upper hand when it comes to the cross of Jesus. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So number one, we come to the altar and we are unified by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then number two, we become an altar, we become a living sacrifice. I'm telling you, I've met people from different nations, different uh, generations, di different cultural backgrounds, but I feel so unified with people that are living their lives in a sacrificial way for the call of God. It's like, you're, you're a me Jesus said it like this, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Those that do the will of my Father in heaven. He's talking about a unity that goes deeper than preferences, that goes deeper than the socioeconomic background that, that world, the world wants to define us by. And he's talking about a unity that is built upon the altar of God. And this is what they did in the book of Ezra. They built their unity upon the altar first, not the building first. That should be important for us right now. They did not build their unity upon the building that they were making. They built their unity upon the altar of God, the place of his sacrifice for them and their sacrificial response to him. Now, what's interesting about these verses from the Apostle Paul is what he says next. So verses you know, 14, 15 talk about receiving from the altar and becoming an altar. And then surprisingly, he makes a statement that, that points us in the direction of unity next in verse 16. Consider the next statement. Therefore, because of the altar factor, therefore from now on we regard no one according to the flesh. What is he saying? We can operate in supernatural unity because we're not trying to get unified over fleshly preferences. Listen, I, I, I'm not saying you shouldn't spend time together. You should, that's why we host community groups at Ramp Church because we want to create spaces of community. However, with that being said, if your attempt at unity is simply built on fleshly preferences, 
then it's going to be incomplete and not have the real depth it's called to have. It's not just your time spent together that creates unity. It is the common value of the altar of God. Before the building, they laid the foundation for the altar, and around that point, they became one man. But this message is not just called unity. It's called generational unity. Because what's beautiful about Ezra chapter 3 is that it's not just a horizontal, you know, uh, coordination between brethren. It is a vertical up and down unity that happens between generations. So let's look at that in Ezra chapter 3, now going to verse 9. In just a moment, we'll read from 9 through the rest of the chapter. But first, let's consider Ezra chapter 3, verse 9. Then Jeshua, again the high priest, with his sons and brothers. It wasn't just his brothers. It was his sons as well. Then Jeshua with his sons and brothers and Cadmiel with his sons and the sons of Judah arose as one. Again, the idea of becoming one man, not just brothers and sisters, but sons and daughters as well. Arose as one to oversee those working on the house of God, the sons of Hinnadad, and their sons and their brethren, the Levites. So there's this unique moment in Ezra chapter 3 where the Levites, the priests, they're gathering together as one man. And it's not just a grown-up meeting. It's a meeting where all generations are, resent, are, are represented and they are unifying around the altar of God. Now, how does that play out? What does that look like? Let's read the, la the, the rest of the chapter and identify some important qualities of what it looks like to be unified generationally. Verse number, today's of the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord according to the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord. This is what they said, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever toward Israel. Then all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Now, this is really where it catches my attention, the next two verses. But many of the priests and Levites and the heads of the fathers' houses, old men who had seen the first temple, wept with a loud voice when the foundation of this temple was laid before their eyes. Yet many shouted aloud for joy. Verse 13, so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout and the sound was heard afar off. What do these... What does this passage, what do these verses teach us about generational unity and what it looks like within the congregation? It teaches us this. We need the blend of sorrow and joy in our sound. We need the blend of sorrow and joy. When the old generation saw the foundation of the new temple, it reminded them of the glory of the old temple and everything they suffered and they wept for what was. When the young generation saw the foundation laid in the new temple, they had no reference point for what was, so they simply rejoiced in what was currently in front of them. And what's amazing to me is that in this moment, there's no description of the young despising the old for their sorrow or the old silencing the young for their joy. The sorrow and joy blended together and it made one sound that went abroad into the nation. And I believe in order for us to move forward in a healthy way, we need the kind of blend of sorrow and joy that they had in Ezra chapter three. Why? Sorrow grounds us in maturity, but joy moves us forward with vibrancy. And we need both a mature sorrow and a vibrant joy. We need a realism that has been shaped by lots of disappointment. And we need a naive faith that doesn't know what it looks like to taste disappointment. And we need the two blending together 
and not fighting against each other or despising each other. We need sorrow and joy in the same sound. And when I say sound, I'm not talking about just our worship sets need some more minor songs. When I say sound, I mean the tenor of who we are as a people. I mean, our conversations, our prayers, what people hear when they listen to the church. So we're not just a young church or an old church. You see, in this moment, if, if we had been living in Ezra chapter 3, we would have said, okay, the sorrow, we're going to have an early morning service for all the sorrow folks. And then a later evening service for all the joy folks. And choose which one you want to be a part of. Instead, they let the sounds blend together and become one sound. We see another moment in scripture where the sorrow of the old and the joy of the young come together to birth some beautiful things. It's in Luke chapter 1. I want to read a few verses here just before we close. Luke chapter 1, verses 39 through 46. It tells us the story of Elizabeth and Mary. Elizabeth was carrying John the Baptist. Mary was carrying Jesus. Elizabeth was an old woman who had years of disappointment and pain and barrenness. Mary was a young woman who was too young to even be pregnant. She didn't even have the right life experience to warrant such a situation. And watch what happens when they come together in unity and blessing. This is in Luke chapter 1, verse 39. Now Mary, now Mary arose in those days and went to the hill country with haste to a city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, that the babe leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then what happens to Elizabeth? Then she spoke out with a loud voice. And said, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. Watch how Mary responds. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord. What are they modeling right here? They're modeling generational unity. Generational unity. Why? They're both carrying a voice, but the way they got that voice was entirely different in its process. Elizabeth was carrying a voice that she received through decades of pain and barrenness. Elizabeth was carrying a voice that was saturated in sorrow. Mary was carrying a voice that had not had the opportunity to know pain yet. She wasn't old enough to know disappointment. So Elizabeth's voice was a result of prolonged sorrow. Mary's voice was a result of premature joy. And they didn't despise and dismiss one another for their process. Mary, when she greets Elizabeth, what does it do? It unlocks her voice, and she says with a loud voice, pick utterances. And when she blesses Elizabeth, what does Elizabeth do? I mean, when Elizabeth blesses Mary, what happens to Mary? Mary's voice, her, her voice gets unlocked, and she begins to prophesy about the work of God. I want to say something to younger, the younger generation in the room. I know a lot of the youth and kids are out, but to those that find themselves in that category, don't dismiss an older generation's voice just because they were not fruitful when you thought they should have been fruitful. Don't look at their disappointment, their pain, and their sorrow as though they lived lives of failure, therefore they don't have anything to say. Had Elizabeth, dis had Mary dismissed Elizabeth because of her decades of barrenness, John's voice would not have been released in the way that it was. Mary's need Elizabeth's, just like Jesus needs a John. Jesus didn't grow up in the wilderness, but John did. And Jesus needed John to go through the wilderness to prepare the way for his voice. Now let me go to the other side and talk to all the Elizabeths in the room regarding Mary's. It may be uncomfortable and frustrating 
when you see God doing something for the next generation that you feel like he didn't do for you. And when that begins to happen, we can either criticize it and curse it, or we can do what Elizabeth did and bless it. And if we will bless it, it will accelerate it. Mary didn't start to prophesy until Elizabeth blessed her and blessed the fruit of her womb. And could it be that this generation is going to carry a fruitfulness and a joy and a revival that we've been praying for for years, but the full acceleration of it is waiting on us to bless it and say we recognize God in the middle of it. So the young can't dismiss the old because they feel like they don't have enough to say because they didn't see revival in their day. And the old can't allow the disappointment of years to cause them to look at the exuberance of the young with a cynical eye and say, well, I remember having those same hopes when I was your age. No, we need both. We need the grounding of sorrow and the energizing of joy. That's what happened in Ezra chapter three. The two sounds came together as one. Let's look at a few more verses very quickly and then we'll be done for this morning. This is in Joel chapter two, verse 28. Usually this is quoted within a larger passage, which I love, but I wanna look specifically at these two statements that God says in Joel two twenty-eight: Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. We need old men dreaming dreams, and we need young men seeing visions, and we need the dreams of the old and the visions of the young coming together as one sound so that we can move forward as a community into the purposes of God for this city. One more verse, and of course this one's really familiar to us, it's in Malachi chapter four, talk about the process of prophetic fulfillment. This is the last prophecy of the Old Testament. This is the very last thing God says before Matthew 1, 1, and it introduces us to prophetic fulfillment through Jesus Christ. I think it should have a bit of importance in our mind. The very last thing God says in the Old Testament, Malachi chapter four, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Why? Because what Elijah's going to do before the day of fulfillment is significant. What is he going to do? What does the spirit of Elijah do? He will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. In other words, if there's not generational unity, then a curse is perpetuated through the land. The way we avoid the curse and the way we embrace the blessing of the Lord is we allow the sorrow of the old and the joy of the young to mingle together into one sound. And we don't split ourselves up so much that there's no opportunity to glean from one another. We need both blended as one. Thank you, Lord. Well, you can go ahead and stand on your feet this morning. The team's gonna join me up here. As they do, I wanna pray over something specific right now. And even as you're standing, just you know, allow your mind and your heart continue to focus and listen, because I, I do believe the Lord wants to speak to you this morning in some specific ways. I believe the Lord wants to encourage people who feel as though their story has nothing to say. I feel like there may be some Elizabeths in the room. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 1 that Elizabeth had lived a righteous life. She was of the tribe of Levi. She was a Levite. She lived consecrated before the Lord. She lived upright, yet barren for decades. Some of you, when you look at your life, you're not as confident as Elizabeth to say, I've lived for God this whole time. You're like, well, there's been a lot of mistakes along the way. But I think there's still an identification with when you look at where you are, all you see is disappointment and sorrow. And I want you to know this morning, I believe the Lord wants you to know, He knows how to use spiritually barren wombs. Historically, most of his promises in the Old Testament came through barren wombs. Most of the promised children in Scripture came through wombs that could not get pregnant without supernatural divine intervention 
that had years of sorrow prior to the moment of, of intervention. Now I want to let you know, just because your story has sorrow doesn't mean it doesn't have something to say. In fact, that's why it has something to say. Mary needs Elizabeth. And Elizabeth, it may be hard to go through decades of disappointment, but there is a day where God unlock, unlocks your voice so that Mary can soar and Jesus can be received. We need your sorrow in the story. We need your pain in the process. You know, who you are is not a marginal issue in the church and stay over there so we can fulfill the promises of God over here. No, it's a part of the very storyline that God's telling through this community. So the team's gonna lead us in worship for a few moments. As they do, I want you and your eyes to look up to the Lord. We have prayer teams available. Maybe you're here this morning and you just need specific prayer for an area of your life. While they lead us in worship, you're welcome to come. Maybe you're here and you don't know Jesus today and you've heard me talking about the altar of God. That altar is available for you this morning. God gave the highest price for you to be in relationship with him. And it was his son on the cross dying for your sins. Wherever you are today, if you'd like somebody to pray with you, we would love to connect with you. But let's take a few moments and lift up our eyes to the Lord and allow fresh hope, fresh faith to come into our hearts. So Father, here we are today. We hear the counsel of your word that, Lord, every Elizabeth is needed. Every Mary is needed. And so, Lord, we take, we ask that you would take the years of our own sorrows, take the years of our own disappointment, those areas where we feel like we are barren and we don't have a lot to show for our faith. Lord, I ask that in a moment, in the days that we're moving into, you would redeem all of that and you would do the good thing in our lives and through our lives that you promised you would do. May faith and hope arise this morning as we set our eyes on you, Father, in Jesus' name.